Welcome to FCPA Flash, the official podcast of FCPA professor, moderated by Professor Mike Kaler. FCPA professor is the leading source of daily FCPA news and commentary and the most authoritative source for those seeking to understand and apply the FCPA. To learn how FCPA professor can elevate your FCPA knowledge, please visit www.fcpaprofessor.com. FCPA Flash is sponsored by Kroll. Kroll is trusted by companies and compliance officers worldwide to help prevent, detect, and remediate FCPA challenges with scalable end-to-end compliance solutions. From high-volume third-party screening and automated monitoring, to risk-based due diligence, to complex investigations and monitorships, with leading experts, global resources, and advanced technology, Kroll is uniquely positioned to meet all your FCPA needs. Thank you for listening to the FCPA Flash Podcast. This is Professor Mike Kaler, and I invite you to my next FCPA Institute in Indianapolis on September 28th through the 29th. To learn more about the two-day FCPA Institute and how it has elevated the FCPA knowledge and practical skills, of a diverse group of professionals, please visit fcpaprofessor.com and click on the FCPA Institute page. Welcome to FCPA Flash. This is Professor Mike Kaler, and in this episode, I am pleased to be joined by Joseph Spinelli. Joe is a Senior Managing Director at Kroll in the Investigations and Disputes Practice based in New York. Prior to his private sector work, Joe served as the first ever Inspector General of New York State and began his career as a Special Agent of the FBI. Thanks for joining me today, Joe. Thanks for having me, Michael. Now, you investigate and assess risk, and investigating and assessing risk is obviously something business organizations should do to manage and mitigate risk in the FCPA context. When you conduct an anti-bribery and corruption risk assessment, what are the key questions that uh, you think business managers should be addressing? Well, I think the first step is to identify the day-to-day risk that their particular organization is faced with. Um, Also, be able to determine how often uh, the company updates its assessment. It's not just sufficient to have one assessment and think that that's the end all. Um, You update it and you continuously conduct these risk assessments. You find out how responsive to change your organization is going to be when you identify a new risk and how you identify and prioritize those critical risks is going to be essential to whether or not you're going to be able to have an effective SCPA compliance program. Also, I think it's essential and most important to have someone internally take ownership of those identified risks and make sure that there's some accountability to ensure that there are internal controls put in place when necessary. Then I think it's it's incumbent upon management and the board to take an active role. You know, the company's risk reports should be shared with management and the board. And the board, I think it's also important that they have the requisite skill sets to provide effective risk oversight. All of this plays into whether or not you're going to have done an incisive risk assessment, which is the first step in really formulating an effective SCPA compliance program. So you've spoken about risk uh, sort of in a generic way. What are some of the uh, specific questions uh, business managers should be asking when when assessing um, their FCPA risk, recognizing that different companies in, in different areas may have different FCPA risks? Mm-hmm. Well, I, I, all, I oftentimes point to the 2011 guidance that the DOJ provided with the three FCPA enforcement actions that came out that year. Uh, I think because they're different in a way, yet they still have some common denominators that should be addressed um, for best practices purposes for your FCPA compliance program. Those enforcement actions were Alcatel, Lucent, Maxwell Technologies, and Tyson Foods. And in each of the deferred prosecution agreements that were listed in those in, in, in those enforcement actions, um, 
seven areas of risk had to be assessed to really be construed to have an effective risk assessment. One was, you know, determine the geographies in which you're doing business and where your company is doing business to ensure that if they're high risk jurisdictions, you're taking all the necessary steps to prevent any potential bribes, bribery. Two, uh, examine what kind of interaction and what types and levels of interaction your organization's having with different governments in those jurisdictions. Um, of course, the industrial sector of operations has is, is got to be a major concern, as well as any involvement with joint venture partners. Um, so oftentimes, joint venture partners will get organizations into trouble, as we've seen. Uh, when you look at 75, 80% of all the enforcement actions seem to involve third parties. Uh, where you're trying to obtain licenses and permits to effectuate your operations, that has to be something that has to be considered and, and addressed, as well as any degree of government oversight that might be in existence in the jurisdiction where you're conducting business. Finally, I think the, the volume and the importance of the goods and personnel going through customs and immigration are areas that also have to be addressed. Yeah, when conducting a risk assessment, if you're coming to this um, uh, topic uh, with, with not much background, it, it sounds like a, a daunting, almost uh, uh, complex and convoluted process. But when you break it down, as you just have, and when business managers take a step back and ask themselves, okay, what points of contact does our company have with foreign officials in the global marketplace because it's going to be these points of contact which can give rise to FCPA scrutiny. So it's as simple really as breaking down a company's points of contact, recognizing that a company with different divisions and different subsidiaries uh, may indeed have different points uh, of contact. You also mentioned in your uh, initial response the, the need to update uh, a company's risk assessments and update its uh, perhaps risk profile. Uh, you can imagine um, specific events in a company's life may warrant uh, an updating, but absent those specific uh, events, what is your general advice for how often a company should, should update its, its risk assessment and risk profile? I think it should be a continuous process. I think, um, you know, I don't like to put uh, every six months, every year. I think that compliance should be taking a, a really hard look at, uh, I think, various points in, in their organization where risk could occur. For instance, um, I like to break it down, Michael, to internal risk where deficiencies might exist in their own employees' knowledge of the company's business profile and their understanding uh, of the associated bribery and corruption risks. Um, I like to also break it down further into the country risks where there are perceived high levels of corruption. If you're doing business in one of the uh, countries like Brazil or India, China, Russia, Korea, you know, Mexico now especially, um, those are countries that have high levels of corruption and have to be taken, and risk has to be taken into consideration in a different way than it would if you were doing business elsewhere. And then there's, you know, transactional risk, you know, involving, you know, maybe your involvement with charitable or political uh, contributions as far as getting licenses and permits, as well as uh, transactional risk as it may pertain to third parties. And finally, as I previously mentioned and alluded to, partnership risk. Uh, foreign business partners that are located in high-risk jurisdictions are very pro problematic and require continuous oversight. And that, to me, is it's more important to, one, identify all the risks I just alluded to, and then to ensure that you're continuously overseeing those risks, not every six months, not every year, but continuously taking a real hard look at where the problems could exist. Now, you mentioned already uh, uh, the FCPA guidance uh, issued by the DOJ and the SEC in, in 2012, which almost by definition, that's uh, the guidance that is uh, rather dated uh, already. You also mentioned a, a, a few enforcement actions. Uh, what other uh, forms of guidance, uh, perhaps from the U.S. government, whether DOJ or SEC, do you find uh, helpful in this regard? Or maybe is it not helpful? I don't know. Well, you know, one of the things that I think I, I 
sounds striking, and, and which I think it's very important, is both the DOJ and the SEC have come out and been very vocal in articulating the rules that they believe the chief financial officers and the finance department should partake in compliance um, in conjunction with the chief compliance officer. And, and I think that they have a, a, a terrific role, and I understand why the SEC has expectations that they do, that the internal audit department, chief financial officer, finance department, all have a role in identifying um, problematic areas where transactions occur. Um, most importantly, I think it all starts with how well are they educated on the FCPA. And what I mean by that is, you know, what do they understand the FCPA terminology? as far as what is a foreign official, what is anything of value. Um, they should be able to, to not only be aware, but be able to identify all the FCPA red flags um, that might exist when they're scrutinizing payments uh, that present the FCPA risk, as well as knowing uh, who in the company is authorized to make those payments. They should review uh, all the employee reimbursements uh, and the requests by third party payments. Um, all of this was was articulated very clearly in many of the conferences I've been to with DOJ and the SEC has now been very, very, I think, vehement in ensuring that uh, it's not just a one-person army of one chief compliance officer that should be, in fact, uh, effectuating the type of compliance that should exist in these organizations. It should be a committee. And this committee should be composed of the people I, I just mentioned, your chief financial officer, your, your members of your finance department, internal audit, and, and ensuring that um, the board and the C-suite also has a role in oversight. All of that, is, I think, is invaluable, and I think the government has uh, provided some very, very uh, important guidance and guidance that I think could go a long way to ensuring that um, the organization, one, has the right culture because of the involvement of all the people I mentioned, and two, that they're continuously overseeing uh, the various areas that could get them into a lot of trouble very quickly. Yeah, there's no doubt that uh, FCPA and related compliance should be a team sport uh, within a company, and people in a wide variety of job duties need a pair of FCPA goggles and the ability to spot risk. Uh, I'll add a couple to the list that uh, that you've also uh, articulated. Given the recent internship and hiring practices, enforcement actions, whether those are uh, at Mellon, yeah, uh, BNY Mellon and yep. um, Qualcomm and J.P. Morgan, we can put to aside uh, for the moment whether those represented uh, actual viable FCPA violations. But I think. It would behoove business organizations, given this new enforcement theory, to make sure human resources uh, personnel are, are well versed and, and be able to spot the risk in what is an otherwise normal uh, job uh, function, and that's hiring people and providing opportunities for, for interns. Uh, charitable giving, of course. Um, not all companies, perhaps depending on their size, have a separate charitable uh, giving department, but many large companies do. And with the uh, increased focus on uh, some charitable giving type cases, um, you need those people in your business organization to have uh, FCPA goggles as well. One thing I know, Joe, you've written about and talked about before is uh, a compliance defense under the FCPA. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if all of what you and I just mentioned would perhaps be relevant not as a matter of internal DOJ and SEC uh, decision-making, which of course is very uh, opaque, but wouldn't it be nice if all this was relevant perhaps as a matter of law? Yeah, and, and I think uh, eventually I'm optimistic that that will transpire. Um, maybe they need to start by replicating the UK Bribery Act and the Adequate Procedures Defense. Um, the adequate procedures defense, as you well know, Mike, is nothing more than having an effective compliance program. And if you're going to expect corporations to expend tremendous amounts of money and time to try and get their house in order and do the right thing and be proactive, then at the very least, I think they should have some rewards for that. 
And I think it should be more than just a mitigating factor. I think it should be a defense in and of itself to ensure that they're not going to face the type of draconic fines that we see each and every day, and that they can assert that, look, we've done all of the necessary training, we've done all of the, we've got policies and procedures to address all our areas of vulnerability internally. We've conducted an, a, a very incisive and comprehensive risk assessment. We know where our vulnerabilities are. And, and I think going forward, you know, we're in pretty good shape. And, and by the way, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that they also take into account the third party risk and conduct that type of risk assessment, which that may, I think they're most vulnerable to as far as getting into trouble. Because it is third parties, Michael, as you all know, that get organizations into trouble the vast majority of the time. And there are key risk indicators that I think are out there, have to be addressed, um, whether it's the geographical location, whether it's the industry, uh, the background, and, and, and of course the identity of, of the third party, or you risk ranking your third parties in conjunction with DOJ's opinion release, 08-02, and where you come upon a high risk third party. Are you conducting enhanced due diligence? And, and are the people, and here's where I find many organizations are coming up short. They are having people conduct this third party due diligence on high risk third parties in jurisdictions where, by and the actual due diligence is being conducted by people who just don't have the, the expertise to conduct the investigation, to speak the language, to know the culture, and to know how and where and when to professionally and legally obtain the information necessary to put them, to give them a comfort level that that third party is someone they should be doing business with. And then also to take a look at the, you know, any connection, obviously, that the third party would have with any government officials or any government entities. Um, you know, these are all high risk factors that have to be taken into account before you're going to do business with a third party, as well as the compensation structure, of course, of the uh, proposed arrangement. You know, what kind of fees are we paying? <laughs> are they asking for success fees? Um, is the third party's compensation is it something that's going to be uh, taking the form of a political or charitable contribution? Um, these are all additional factors that I think have to be taken into account when, in fact, you're going to make a determination whether or not you're going to have someone out there, a third party, doing business on your behalf. Yeah. Returning to uh, a compliance defense for a moment, if listeners are interested in, in reading more about this, uh, uh, you may want to uh, check out the article, Revisiting a Foreign Corrupt Practices Act Compliance Defense, and it's important perhaps to keep a following uh, uh, facts in mind. Um, most other countries that, like the United States, are part of the OECD convention and actually do recognize corporate criminal liability, most of these other countries do have uh, compliance-like defenses, regardless of what they're specifically called, um, embedded in their FCPA-like statutes. Another fact is the number of former DOJ and SEC FCPA officials who have taken public positions on a compliance defense, um, it seems like almost all of them universally uh, agree on, on the value, um, both from a legal perspective and more importantly, perhaps from a policy perspective uh, of a compliance defense. So these are some additional um, you know, factors uh, people may want to consider. Now, you, you mentioned third parties and, and provided a, a good high-level checklist of, of things that business organizations uh, uh, may want to do in terms of uh, third-party compliance. Let's talk a little bit about technology for a moment. Obviously, um, you know, it's the year 2017 and how companies go about um, compliance, uh, not just in the FCPA context, but but other areas is probably a little bit different uh, today than it was 10, 15, um, 20 years ago. Uh, what sort of technology uh, do you think works uh, in this space? And, and related to that perhaps is can business organizations perhaps become too reliant on technology, in other words, too much artificial intelligence and not enough real intelligence? Well, I think, I think it's a combination of both. First, let's start by saying that I, I believe and I'm an advocate that technology really can make a difference in, in making a strictly paper-based process far more 
cost effective and cost efficient. Um, here, you know, at Kroll, we, we're somewhat blessed in that we have a, a, an extraordinary compliance portal that can manage, mitigate, and, and really monitor third-party risk. Um, we risk rank our third parties for our clients through our portal by having the business sponsor send out a questionnaire. Uh, the questions that we include on that, um, you you know, you mentioned there has to be a human aspect to this. Well, you know, who formulates those questions and how relevant they are to what you need to ascertain to make an informed judgment is very, very important. But when you receive the questionnaire back from that third party, you know, it's no longer going to end with the business sponsor. It's going to go to the compliance officer who will take a look at it. And now I'm seeing the compliance officer is, is then going to send it to the general counsel. And the general counsel will normally, you know, opine on whether or not they think that's someone at the end of the day they want to do business with. And, you know, I think to really get your arms around the large population of third parties that some of these organizations are faced with and, and do it in, you know, in a real time risk screening uh, time factor, you know, and do it proactively, not after the fact, but proactively assessing a customer's risk profile. Um, you know, it's, it's got to be done with, with I think, the, the most modern technology, whether it's uh, the compliance portal we have or, you know, any other type of, you know, uh, I want to say technological advanced uh, portal that, in fact, could risk rank these third parties. You can't do this manually, and, and, and it would cost you millions if you had, let's say, 2,000, 3,000, and that's not a large number of third parties in some of the organizations and companies that we deal with. We've, we've actually risk ranked as many as 300,000 third parties for one specific company. You tell me how you're going to do that manually. It's impossible. So to really do it in an incisive way, you know, it requires a, a compliance portal like we have, and it, it requires not only having a portal, but from a human perspective, once in fact you've risk ranked them, that's nice. Um, and when you come upon the high risk category, third parties, you know, it may require boots on the ground. And you need to have that capability also, having people who can actually go and find out what they need to find out about those third parties and drill down on the backgrounds of those third parties to give you a true comfort level whether or not they're reputable and whether or not they're actually in the business of doing what they say they do. Do they really even have a business address? And so we found many instances they don't. Um, and then equally as important, Mike, is, is the fact that you better have a component there that can provide interval monitoring of those third parties. It's not enough to do it once. And the government's been very clear on this. And, and every time I hear government officials speak on this particular topic, I'm hearing more and more that it used to be, well, you know, you should do it annually. Now I hear people talking every six months, you should be, you know, basically redoing your third parties, update them, find out if the status has changed. Have they become officials, you know, public officials? Are they now dealing with government entities that they weren't dealing with previously? Uh, all of this plays into, one, uh, the technological uh, needs to be able to do this, and two, the, and to have the, the people with the right um, investigative expertise to supplement the technology. It takes a, it's a bifurcated approach, and if you're going to do it right, you need both, both, both types of that. I mean, certainly if there are change business circumstances or the emergence of red flags, companies should um, revisit um, or revise or, or take a look at uh, their third party base. But um, I've heard similar things from government officials uh, myself. It's quite easy for a government bureaucrat who's not footing the, who's not footing the bill for any of this just to stay, uh, say X, Y, or Z at a conference. It's quite another thing. Um, when they're the, the ones uh, uh, paying for this thing, and I guarantee you their position is probably going to change once they're into private practice, or perhaps not, because it's it's good for their practice, too. <laughs> I was going to say, maybe, maybe not, Michael. <laughs> 
So you're absolutely right that technology can can play a, a role here, particularly when you have large multinational companies with uh, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of, of third parties. And perhaps my next comment sort of dovetails with the compliance defense uh, issue we've been talking about. But one of the downsides of, of technology is uh, technology can can easily be circumvented and can easily be uh, overridden by people who are intent on, on breaking the rules. And indeed, when you, um, when you look at most FCPA enforcement actions, I'm clearly not saying all, but most FCPA enforcement actions are based upon a very, very small group of actors in a company who knew the controls that the company had in place, but took active uh, covert measures in many cases to intentionally circumvent the policies and procedures, including technology policies and procedures um, the company had. I mean, you know, some uh, of the individuals who have violated the FCPA have literally said, there's nothing I would have done or there's nothing that could have been done to stop me. I was intent on breaking the law. And, you know, that, that's difficult um, for a business org- organization to deal with. And perhaps that just dovetails with the compliance defense issue we've been talking about. Yeah, it does. And, and I think it's equally as important to state that if you do all of the, uh, if you take all the steps that we've been talking about for the last 15, 20 minutes in trying to proactively address the issues you just raised, um, I believe, and, and um, I've seen it, firsthand that the government will consider that a mitigating factor regardless of the fact if you have a rogue third party or you know whatever that goes out there and, and does all the nefarious things you just mentioned I think that you know if you could show them you've you've taken all the necessary steps possible to address your third parties and provide the type of due diligence that is required and one does go basically and do something you know wrong and, and takes a bribe or whatever I think you're in pretty good shape as far as the government is concerned and I'd like to think they would take that into account and give you the credit for it uh, now of course as you well know with the Yates memo they're also expecting you to identify the individuals involved before you're going to get credit but that said I believe the government is, and I'm optimistic that the government's going to take this to the next step eventually. Um, and basically, uh, I'd like to see law passed where there is a compliance defense. And um, all of the things that we mentioned is, as far as risk assessments and all the steps necessary to get your house in order, when they've been done, you'll be rewarded for it. Well, time will definitely tell whether the FCP or whether the United States will join uh, other peer nations in amending the FCPA to uh, uh, include compliance defense-like concepts. And uh, uh, if if that happens, uh, you can bet uh, FCPA professor uh, website and, and others uh, will be talking about it in great detail. Uh, thanks for uh, joining uh, me today, Joe. Uh, today's guest has been Joseph Spinelli. He's a senior managing director at Kroll uh, in the Investigations and Dispute Practice uh, Department uh, based in New York. And we've been talking about risk assessments, uh, compliance defense, and, and other compliance-related topics uh, today. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, Michael, for having me.